Hello. In lesson 1.6, finding inverse functions, you'll learn to graph the inverse of a function, find the inverse of a function algebraically, and determine if two functions are inverses. Now, the first one is also, this first uh, learning objective right here is also going to help us find the inverse of a function uh, informally. So let's recall again what it means to have an, an inverse. Now, because an inverse switches the x and the y value, that means that for every a, b that lies on the graph of a function f, then the point b, a, switching the x and the y, is going to lie on the graph of the inverse and vice versa. This means that the inverse is a reflection of our function f over the line y is equal to x, as illustrated in the following uh, graph right here. So as you see right here, notice that these points on the blue curve are reflected of the points on the red curve across this line here. So let's plot those points and let's locate and identify what those points are. So let's do the red on the left side and we'll call the red one f of x. And the location of these points for the red graph starting with the one on the very far left is negative 9, 0. Then we have a point at negative 8, 1, 5, 2, 0, 3. And then the one on the very far right side is 7, 4. So from left to right, we have those points there. Let's say that the blue one is the inverse. Well, let's call the blue one the inverse. And let's make a t-chart for the inverse function. And we'll start from the bottom going up. So we'll start at 0, negative 9, then 1, negative 8. The third point from um, the third one is at 2, negative 5. Then we have 3, 0. And then finally, 4, 7. And this one, I forgot to put the negative sign on that one. That one is at negative 5, 2. And see how these points on the left are reflected on the right across the line y is equal to 0? So if I was to fold it across this dotted line, the two graphs, again, would match up perfectly and align on top of each other. Now, this is useful because we can use this in order to informally get the inverse of a function. So, for example, on number 1, here our function f of x is this line y equals 2x minus 1. So, if I look at the x and y values that I have for f of x, starting again from left to right, we have a point at negative 6, 0, I'm sorry, at 0, negative 6. On the y-axis, 0, negative 6. We have a point at 3, 0. And then we have this other point at 6, 6. If I flip this, let me make this a little bit smaller. And I flip this, then I get the points for the inverse. So, 0, negative 6 flipped would be negative 6, 0, then 0, 3, and then the last one, well, the last one is the same number, 6, 6. And let's plot those points. So if I plot these points in blue, connecting those points with a straight line, let me make it as straight as possible, we end up with this line right there. And with that line, we can informally come up with the equation for the inverse. Because the equation, again, of this inverse is a line, mx plus b, we only need two things. We need to figure out what the slope is, and we need to figure out the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is easy to see. We can clearly see that we're crossing the y-axis at 3. So our y-intercept is equal to 3. And by simply counting the rise over the run, we go from, let's go from this point, let me get a different color, let's go from this point to that point right there. That is a rise of 1, 2, 3, and a run of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6.
So y is a 3 over a run of 6 that reduces to 1 half. So here is the equation of our inverse. So our, our inverse, the, the equation to this line here is 1 half x plus 3. Now, let's look at another example. Let's look at example number two. So for this example, we have a quadratic. Now, normally quadratics do not have inverses because they look like this, and, and it's, a not, it's not a one-to-one -one function. But if I exclude the domain um, of less than zero and only focus for the values of x greater than zero, we, on, we end up with this half right there. And I have another point that I forgot to plot. Let's put a dot right here, and we have that point there uh, uh, for our function. So let's make a t-chart for f of x and start from the bottom, 0, negative 4, and go into the right. So from left to right, we have 0, negative 4. We have 1, negative 3. This point is at 2, 0. And then the last point is at 3, 5. The inverse will then have the following points. Negative 4, 0, negative 3, 1, 0, 2, and 5, 3. And that graph will look like this. Now this graph in blue, if you recognize it, that is your square root function. It's just been shifted four units to the right. So the equation to this function here, the equation to the inverse, is going to be the square root function simply shifted horizontally four units to the right. And there is our equation, x plus 4. Now, this is so fascinating about these functions. Now look at this. The original function was squaring x to the second power and then subtracting 4. Notice how the inverse undoes those operations in the opposite order. We have x plus 4 instead of x minus 4. And instead of raising it to the second power, we have the square root. Now, not only are these two things doing the opposite thing, but they're also doing the, these opposite operations in the opposite order. Notice that the order, uh, the order of operations for this one will first get x, raise it to the second power, and then it would subtract the 4. For this function here, the order operation first requires us to add the 4 to the x, and then that answer, whatever that answer is, that answer is going to be the square root. We then take the square root of that. So it does these operations in the opposite order. It adds it first and then takes the square roots to undo and cancel the, that function up there. So the inverse, again, is very fascinating how simple and how, again, how beautiful this thing works out because it uh, undoes the other function. So the simplicity of this, again, and how it is the opposite to x squared minus 4 is unique and very fascinating to look at. So let's look at another example. So like in this example right here, we have the cubic function. Notice that this thing has been shifted three units to the right and one unit up. Again, that plus three and plus one. So three units to the right and plus one. And it has the following points. So let's plot the points for f of x. We have the point on the very far left. We'll go from left to right. So negative five, negative seven, negative four, zero, negative 3, 1, negative 2, 2. And then we have the one at the very top. That's 1, 9. And now let's plot the points for the inverse. So negative 7, negative 5, 0, negative 4, 1, negative 3, 2, negative 2, and then 9, 1. Let's plot them. 
let's try to connect these again as well as possible. It's going to curve. And the graph's going to look like this. Now, it's not the best looking curve that should it look like, but this should be very familiar to the cube cubic function. So the cube, uh, the cube root function, I'm sorry, the cube root function. Now, the cube root function, again, has been shifted. However, normally this point right there, this point right there is at the origin. And we can clearly see that it's been shifted one unit to the right and three units down. So the function for this inverse would be the cube root of x minus 1, that horizontal shift of 1 unit to the, uh, to the right, and two, 3 units down. Was it 3 units? Yes, 3 units down. So minus 3. So this would be the inverse to this function here, to f of x. And look, look how beautiful, again, this, this is being undone by this. Notice that we are not adding one. We're now subtracting one. We're not adding three. We're subtracting three. And we're taking, again, now the root of three instead of raising it to the power of three. And notice, again, how everything is done in the opposite order. According to the order operations, if I plug in a number here for the x, if I plug in the number nine for x, the order of operations will first add the three. Notice that that's the last thing I do here, is subtract that. I will then raise it to the third power, which again is the cube root. And then finally, the last thing I will do is add one, which on the inverse is the first thing I do right here. I first plug in a number here. I would have to subtract it, take the root, and then subtract three. So it's the complete opposite of that function of f of x. Let's do one more example. So let's graph again the inverse to f of x. By first recognizing what points we have for f of x, we have negative 6, negative 5. We have the point uh, 1, negative 4, 2, negative 3, 3, negative 2. And then our last point is at 10, 1, 10, negative 1. So our inverse would have the following points. And let's plot these things. So negative 5, negative 6. one negative one ten and if I connect these well enough you should recognize that this is your cube function so this function our inverse is the transformation of our cube function and our cube function normally has this point here at the origin so it's been shifted three units to the left and two units up so our inverse function would be the x mm, plus 3 to shift it to the left by 3 to the third power. That gives it that S, that curved shape. And then shifting it up two units will add to your outside. And look again how it's the complete opposite to that. The 2 and the 3 switch, instead of subtracting them, we're adding both of them. And again, instead of raising this to the one third power or getting the cube root, we're raising it now to the third power. And there you go. So um, this is a way, again, this is a way of finding an inverse function, again, informally. We say we're finding the inverse function of this, the, of, of this informally by using a graph and seeing what the transformation to the parent function is. So... Now let's go how to find the inverse algebraically.
Well, to find the inverse of a function algebraically, we start by simply switching again the x and the y, since that's what inverses do. By doing that, we're then going to solve the equation for y, and that's how we end up with the inverse. So remember that f of x and y is the exact same thing. So you'll notice again that we use f of x notation, function notation, instead of y. But we're going to make that switch and replace that with the y. And then we're going to switch the independent, independent variable, meaning switch the x with the y. So let's look at an example. So right here, f of x, remember, is the same thing as y. So this equation is 3, y is equal to 3x minus 5. So what we do is that we start by switching the y with the x. So instead of 3x minus 5, we have 3y minus 5. And we're going to equal it to x instead of y. So then we replace again the y with our x. So solving this equation, we would start by moving the 5 to the other side. So we add 5 to both sides. And we're going to divide by 3. So y equals to x plus 5 divided by 3. And this is our inverse. So using the notation for inverse, f inverse equals x plus 5 divided by 3. And this is how what we're looking for. That's our inverse. Let's do another equation. Let's do our cube root. So again, this is the same thing as y. And we're going to switch the x and the y. So we'll have the cube root of y minus 1 minus 4 on the outside, and that's going to equal to x. So I want to, again, subtract the 1 and the negative 4. I can't combine those because the 1 isn't grouped inside the cube root with the y. So I want to start by first moving the 4 to the other side. By doing that, that isolates, that'll be plus 4, that isolates the cube root, and I can now get rid of the cube root. I do that by raising both sides to the third power. Now the cube root and the power of 3 cancel each other out. And now I have y minus 1 equals 2x plus 4, and all of that raised to the power of 3. Ah, now I can move the 1 to the other side. And I end up that y equals x plus 4 to the third power plus 1. And that is our inverse. All right, let's look at another example with the square root. So pretty much the same thing. We have the square root. So let me replace the x with the y and just have it equal to x. That's essentially what we're doing here. That's what we essentially start off with by replacing this with a y and then simply just equaling to x. Now in this example, I can't move the 5 to the other side until I get rid of the square root. So since our index is, is invisible too, we're going to raise both sides to the second power. I can now subtract the 5 to both sides and divide by 2. And there's our inverse. And just one last example, let's say we have this one, this cubic function. So we'll start by replacing the x with a y, equally to x. And this one requires us to move the 8 to the other side, so we'll subtract that 8 to both sides. Before I can move the 6 to the other side, I have to get rid of that cube. And that requires us to use the cube root. And now I can add 6 to both sides. 
and there's your inverse. And again, look at the beauty of the, of the simplicity of this. Look how in the function, if I plug in a number into this function here, if I plug in the number one, the first thing I would have to do is to subtract six. After subtracting six, I would have to raise it to the third power. I would have to cube it. And then finally, I will then add the eight to get an answer by plugging in the number nine in for the value of x, which is going to be, I believe, like 35 or something like that, okay? Well, look what happens when I plug in a number into this function right here. Let's say I plug in the number 35. If I plug in the number 35, the first thing I would have to do is subtract 8. Then I would have to take the cube root. And then finally add 6. Notice that this operation here is the opposite of this. And again, the inverse opposite of this. The adding and uh, subtracting of 8 will cancel each other out. So the cube and the cube root will cancel each other out. And the 6 and the plus 6 will cancel each other out. And by doing that, the only thing that will be left, again, is the original number that I start off with. Well, with this gives me, again, the number 35. Doing this is going to end up giving me the number 9, going back and giving me the, the number 9. So if I plug in this number into the inverse, it's going to again do the opposite operations and give me the number that I start off with in this function here which leads to the next thing so how do I verify if two functions are inverses to each other I can verify by doing exactly that by plugging one function into the other if functions f and g are composed in this order and the only thing that I have left is x for every x in the domain of g and the same thing is true by plugging f into g, and I all I get is x for every x again for the in the domain of f. Basically, the number I start off with, plug it into this one, and then that answer gets plugged into f, and I end up back there with, with the original number. Basically, these two things cancel each other out. Then these two functions are inverses of each other. g, g is going to equal to the inverse of the f, and f is going to equal to the inverse of g. So let's look at two examples. So let's verify that these two functions are inverses. And again, we do that by doing the following compositions. This is going to put this function into f. So we have 3 times 1 third x plus 2 and then minus 6. This distributes and we end up with simply x plus 6 minus 6. And that combines these two terms here, leaving us only with x. Now, if I do it the other way and I do this composition, that's going to put function f into g. So that would be 1 third times 3x minus 6 plus 2. Let's distribute, and that's going to give us x minus 2 plus 2, which again then just leaves us with the value of x. So you see these compositions, this composition proved that these two functions are inverses to each other because plugging one function into the other is going to cancel each other out, and the only thing we're going to be left with is the identity x, basically the number I started off with. So if I plug in the number, uh, let, if I plug in the number 1, stop erasing, when I plug in the number 1, right into g that's going to equal to some value and then that value plugged into f is going to end up back with the number one so if i plug in the number one like let's do three let's do three so if i plug in three into g that multiplies three with one third which is one and one plus two is three now let's plug in the number three into this one 
So three times three is nine, and nine minus six is three. So you see, I end up back with the number I originally started off with. This gives me nine, I'm sorry, this gives me a three, and then plugging it into F again gives me back the original number of F. So there you go. Let's do one more example. Let's verify that these two things are inverses. So we'll start by first doing fog and plugging G into F. So X squared, so our X is gonna be this to the second power plus two. The square and the square root cancel each other out and the negative two and positive two cancel each other out. Here, now let's plug in F into G, and we're gonna get the square root of X squared plus two minus two. Here we would subtract the twos first, gives us zero, and now taking the square and the square root, that gives us X. And you see, these two functions give me the identity when I do the compositions, and that implies again that these two functions are inverses. So, f is equal to the inverse of g and g is equal to the inverse of f and there you have it. again thank you again for watching if you do have any questions please send me a message on reminder through email i again appreciate you watching and i hope you have a great day